Lakeview is blessed by many servants, the men who have helped us this morning, led us, help lead us in worship, so grateful for those, those men. I really want to encourage you, if you can, to attend the men's breakfast and the training session next Saturday, uh, because that prepares us to be more effective in how we serve. And I also want to encourage the ladies in, I think, two weeks to be here for the meeting uh, of uh, the, the ladies' ministry. Every woman in the congregation needs to be at this meeting because it involves everybody. And what the men do this morning, what the ladies have done so effectively for a number of years, is crucial to this being a healthy uh, family of God. It helps us to do the words that are on the screen right now. One of the purposes for our working together in the church is to prepare us to work outside of the church. The characteristics we develop, the skills that we can hone by serving one another within this building, within the confines of of this group of people, the characteristics we develop, the character with which we serve is intended to help us do an effective job out there. So, so I want to encourage you to be able to give your heart to service within the body of Christ, to prepare you for service outside of the body of Christ. I think this statement on the screen right now uh, words of Jesus, and he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. This is, Jesus said, this is the most important commandment for us to live out. And it not only kind of tells us what to do, but how to do it. And that's the most significant aspect of this. How to do it with all your heart. Not just part of it. With all your soul, not just part of it. With all your mind, not just part of it, but all of it. I think when Christians don't buy into this, it makes a church weak. And outside of the church, we see people... um, This is a picture of a life that is totally committed to God. Totally committed. And that's the problem in our society is people are not totally, they're not totally committed to anything. Or if they are totally committed, they're totally committed to the wrong thing. But most often, they're just a hodgepodge of things that I feel like I need to be doing, and so we don't, we don't focus on anything in any sort of vocation. If you are not focused on what you're doing, you're going to not be very successful. We have to be fully committed individuals in serving the church, and that prepares us to serve outside. This same passage, a parallel passage, is found in the book of Mark. And, and uh, as in the context of this, the, the people, uh, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the people that are trying to trick Jesus and, and foul him up, they're, they're asking him this question, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And he, he gives it to them. And uh, in, the, in the account in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 12, uh, the scribe, uh, smartly so, agrees with Jesus. He says, yes, Lord, you are right. That's a, that's a great place to And then saw that he answered intelligently. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And I think that's a statement for us to consider this morning as we think about my service to the church. Would the words be said to us, you are not far from? from the kingdom of God? Or, or would, would these words truly define us and it's because... So what, what is... When Jesus makes that statement to him, what's he talking about? What's he missing? He's missing Jesus. 
He's, he's missing the elements of the work of Christ and, and what that does to the human heart. The transformation that uh, this gift of grace and this gift of mercy does. Uh, soon as that man that is questioning Jesus figures that one out, he's going to be where he needs to be. And that's, that's true for us. If we're going to be able to serve Jesus with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, we're going to need to make three changes in our lives. And that first is we're going to need to make a change in our status. And in the passage that Tony read, that's really what this morning is all about. Um, hopefully this passage is highlighted or underlined or, or something like that uh, in your own Bible because it is such a crucial passage to understanding the words of Jesus. When Jesus says, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, um, this breaks it down for us to help us to understand how we do that. How do we get from where we are to where we need to be? And he starts out, uh, verses 1 through 4, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. See, he's pulling our attention to all of the things that God has done for us through Jesus. He's wanting us to focus on that as our motivation. My motivation to serve is not because it's my duty to God and not because I want you to see how amazing a person I am. It's because of what Jesus has done for me. That's the only motivation that lasts for being a servant. And that's the only thing that keeps me going. Because oftentimes, if it's, if it's because of how you think about me because I'm serving, at some point you're going to say, Dennis is kind of a jerk sometimes, you know. So, so that motivation's gone. Uh, or maybe I, I fail at something personally, and, and, and uh, so you know, I, I want to prove because how good I am. And when I serve, pff, that motivation's gone. The only motivation that, that sticks is what Paul opens this chapter with. He says, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so there's got to be, if I'm going to fulfill this call to worship the Lord, to serve the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, I'm going to have to change my status. I'm going to have to change at how I look at myself. And, and one of the key words from this is that, that when we become Christians, we're demoted. We're demoted. That means um, uh, opposite of the way the world works. Uh, if you do a good job, if, uh, if, if you're doing all the right things in your job, in your career, they're going to promote you. But that's not the way it is in faith. I have to take this demotion in how I look at myself. And really, really what it's going after is our sense of pride. Our sense of entitlement to ourselves. A sense of, uh, the sense that we have of putting ourselves first instead of putting others first, putting God first. As we read on in that passage, uh, you know, we, we, we might ask, okay, I can see putting uh, others before myself, okay, like to what extent? And Paul tells us that Jesus he just didn't like see himself as as uh, lower than others, but the lowest, a bond servant. He says this is a a basic slave. It's in the status of of any economy. This is a nobody. You become a nobody, and that's that's hard for us to do because everything around us tells us that we're somebody. Even if our team loses the Little League baseball game, you still get a trophy. You're still somebody, even though, really, with baseball, you're nobody.
the change in status begins with that I'm willing to see myself in a completely different light. God is going to take care of us. And it doesn't matter what place we occupy in this world. Whether it is a place of accomplishment and success, or a a place of uh, some of the lowest occupations in our country, in our society. He will take care of us. The the second word that uh, that focuses, that explains this change in my status is, is, I'm humbled. I'm humbled. When I read what Paul says in those first opening letters, and how he tells me I need to focus on what Jesus has done, Do you ever feel when when somebody gives you something, a gift, that you know you don't deserve? Maybe it's for Christmas. Christmas is coming up. And they give you this thing, and you just, I just, I don't deserve this. You know, it's not because you don't deserve it. You may very well deserve that nice, shiny gift. But you're humbled by it. it. It makes you... It makes you feel more important about yourself than you feel that you are. That's that's what being humbled means. Because I have this this immense freedom now in Christ to live my life any way. I'm I'm humbled. Because I've been given a position of status, and I guess why I guess that's why I'm I'm willing to humble myself and I'm willing to be demoted because in God's eyes I'm really significant and important. That's an ultimate truth of life. It, it doesn't mean I'm less. When I say I'm demoted, that doesn't mean I'm less than than anything. When I'm humbled, that doesn't mean I'm less, it's just a mindset. As opposed to pride, I am I'm, I'm humble. And then the final word is submitted. And, and that's where uh, I am willing to do whatever God asks me to do. I'm willing to take on whatever cause he has given me because of the debt that I owe. I think that's the idea behind a bond servant is... The bond servant is, is deeply in debt to the person, and so they don't have a choice. They have to serve. And we do it willingly. We submit ourselves willingly. I, I no longer hold up the corporate ladder model of success and recognition. I'm no longer about image and self-promotion. I don't need that anymore. What I, what I need is to figure out how I represent Jesus in the world that I live in. He, uh, Paul says, you know, have, have the same attitude. How do I do that? How do I develop that? How do I capture that in my life? The second change I need to make is a change in the status of others. Um, this can be such, this, this is more of a challenge. And I'm gonna say, if you don't get that first change right, you're probably not gonna get this change right. We think as we evaluate and observe other people that the things we see, you know, it's, it's legitimate. If someone does something dumb, we're gonna say, you, do, you deserve the title to be called dumb. You've earned that. But that doesn't necessarily help them. It doesn't matter really what people do. They matter to God. And because they matter to God, they matter to me. And and what this enables me to do is I don't have to be responsible for those people. Now, if if people start careening in my lane, you know what I mean by that, uh, I mean, that can happen in a lot of areas of life where people are steering into my lane. Then I need to take some action. But basically, I need to try and understand what people are going through. Because I know my path to Jesus was a journey of stuff I was going through. 
and somebody said something to me. And it wasn't somebody in this building. Uh, What I mean is that it didn't take place in this building. It didn't take place in any church building. It took place outside this church building where people uh, said things to me that made me think about my life and made me think I could do something different. Maybe they didn't realize it, but they were elevating me. They were helping me to see up. They were helping me to see something better. They were helping to see that, that I matter. Christ's death on the cross is God's statement of how much we matter. Period. And so how do I do that? How do, how do I begin to look at people differently from the ways I feel like, based on my observations, I have a right to look at them? Or because of their behavior, how I should look at them? I, I can't do that anymore. Everybody is on a journey from one place to another place. And I've got to figure out, and not everybody's going to listen. Not everybody's going to hear what you have to say. But there are some people who will hear what you have to say. And am am I going to be ready to serve them with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind? When I serve others, it's not even a statement of what they matter, what they mean to me. When I serve others with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, it's a statement of how much they mean to God. They don't have to mean anything to me. It's, it's what they mean to God. It's, it's kind of like, <laughs> yep, uh, you're the sort of knucklehead that only God could love. I'm, I'm good with that. But that's my action toward them. That's what that says. How much they mean to God. And that's why a lot of times people are confused when Christians don't act the way Christians are supposed to act. Because we're supposed to be representing how God feels and thinks about stuff. And that's a tall order. To have the compassion that God has, that's, that's a tough goal to shoot for. But that's what people assume of us, because that's kind of what we say. We're Christians, we're God's people here on earth. Okay, well, we don't always well represent that. But it's, it's, it's a goal. It is a goal that we need to have, that because they matter to God, then I'm going to look at it from that perspective. I have to have a change in the status of others. And then finally, I have to change my paradigm for success. There's always this this way that things go. Uh, I I found, you can find all kinds of little graphics that explain how to succeed. And this is a company says, achieving success is easier once you've mastered our formula. So you see the enthusiasm they're trying to communicate with that. And you go, wow, okay, okay. And, but look at those, look at those elements. And it just, this was kind of an afterthought, but, uh, it's true. I need to change my attitude about stuff. If, if my paradigm for success is going to be God's, I gotta change my attitudes. My talent, I have to see that I have talent. That I have uh, something worth giving. I have to see, uh, develop the skills. I, I have to attain knowledge. I have to focus on goals. All of these are true. But if they're not connected to faith, all of this is kind of worthless. And again, Jesus said to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. What's missing in this formula? Christ is missing in this formula. The mercy of God is missing in this formula. The action that God took on my behalf is missing from this formula. And so I'm looking for a new paradigm. And that is the paradigm that was demonstrated to us by the life of Christ. And I I think we have to realize, Jesus doesn't expect us to do anything he didn't already do. He doesn't expect us to to engage in situations he hasn't already engaged in. He's seen everything that we're going to see. 
Uh, we've just got to lose this idea that this time in history is like no other time in history. That's not true. History's always been screwed up. Can I get an amen? It's, <laughs> it's always been messed up. It's always had its problems. And that's because the paradigm for success, often with people, cuts Jesus out of the paradigm. And that's what makes the difference in our own lives. And he didn't just tell us what to do. He modeled it for us. He showed us how to live it out. And of course, he did teach us. He did teach us that that success looks different. It's, it's upside down. This passage in Matthew 20, it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, who want, whoever wants to become great must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's a different standard of success. And I've got to accept this change in how I view what success is. I think it was back in the, maybe the late 40s, the movie It's a Wonderful Life came out. And the movie was based on a short story written by a fellow named Philip Van Dorn Stern. Van Dorm Stern uh, wrote this story. It was called A Great Life. That's, that's what the story was originally called. And it was adopted for a screenplay. And how many of you have a copy of that movie in your personal video library? Raise your hands high. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, lots of them. Lots of you do. Because it's a great story. But did you know it was a box office flop? And, and you wonder why. And it's because, even though maybe the morality of our culture was different even then, the idea is too sentiment. It's, it's too mushy. It's, it's like, it's not even realistic, according to popular theory. It's, it's just a movie. But it really is the gospel. James Stewart said, uh, talking uh, talking to uh, Philip Van Dorn Stern said, uh, it's an inspiration to everyone concerned, involved in the picture. The fundamental story was so sound and right. And that's absolutely true. So it doesn't reflect that the story wasn't good. It reflects a culture that is beginning to lose track of what's right. And just the idea, and you know the story of It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, George Bailey wanted to be, uh, wanted to see the world, wanted to, to design great skyscrapers and, and do things, build bridges, do things no one else has ever done. But what happens? He gets stuck in this little one-horse town uh, working at this broken-down savings and loan, doing nothing. But as the story goes on, it's revealed he's, he's impacted people in an amazing way. And in a way that he never would have been able to do had he, had he followed the paradigm success of, of culture. You know, in the banking industry, in that little town, what was it called? Bedford Falls, the little town? You know who was representing the uh, standard paradigm of success uh, in banking in that town? What was that guy's name? The the guy in the wheelchair? What? Potter. Potter, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Potter. Yeah. 
uh, broken old. He, it's, yeah, it's, you gotta, go, you, we got to watch the movie again, okay? And and I mean that's that's the real paradigm here. This is this is not just Hollywood, although it was a time where Hollywood did some good work. But that's really it. It's it's this selfish, self-absorbed, self-promoting. It's all about me and what I can get, as opposed to someone who's just trying to help people. And, and I know maybe in this world, that doesn't sell. But we're not about this world. We're about something else. We're about something greater, something bigger, something more significant, more important. That's what we're about. This is God's paradigm for success, that you invest your life in others. And, and that's how the story ended up. He got everything he was looking for from the false paradigm of Success. And so it's important for us to accept this premise that serving God through serving the church with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind, it prepares me to serve outside. On the screen is a postage stamp of a, a person who was killed at, in Auschwitz in 1941. His name is Maximilian Kolbe. Um, he was a Franciscan monk and had committed his life to a pattern of uh, really this, of living his life in service to others. When the Nazis invaded Poland, he knew that it wouldn't be long until uh, what he was responsible for would be taken over by the Nazis. And so he sent all of his people home except just a few. And they carried on for a couple of years in doing things that served the needs of the refugees, including helping 2,000 Jews find a place of safety. And, and we know Jews in that period of time were, uh, uh, were being exterminated. And so he took a stand, he served others. And because of that, he was thrown into the concentration camp. And at Auschwitz, they, uh, they devised creative ways to kill people. But one of the ways that was most just basic was do nothing. Just let people die and starve. Or give them so much or so little that, that they would just be barely surviving. And in this context, Colby is, is trying to be a faithful Christian, trying to live out his faith. And, and oftentimes he would go without food to be able to see that others may have food. It happened that somebody from their area escaped. And when, when someone escaped from Auschwitz, then... Uh, they would kill ten people as a, as a lesson, you know. And, and they, they, to say they, they killed them, is, it's not even an accurate statement. They just they threw them in a hole and took away all their food. And so they just slowly starved to death. And, and there was a man who uh, was a father and a husband, and, and as he, his name was called to be one of those ten, he said, you know, please spare me. And, and Colby said, let me take his place. And, you know, I'm, I'm not making this up. He, he really did that. He took it serious when he heard the words of Christ that said, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, he took that serious. He said, so that's everything. And so he said, I will exchange my life for this person. And after the period of time when most of the people were dead, uh, Colby was still alive, the guards came in and gave them all a lethal injection and, and just, they needed room for, for the next group to, to die. The man who survived lived till he was 95 years old. Uh, 
live the full life, live the life that was dramatically affected by the actions of one other person. Don't you know that man woke up every morning grateful for the gift of life that he had been given? And he probably did everything he could to make that count. To live a life worthy of the sacrifice that that he received. And and you may say, you know, this is totally ridiculous. Um, Six million Jews died, so one is spared. And, And that's the way our world looks at it. And, it's, it's, and this is this is the change that we have to turn within ourselves. We have to be able to look at, even if it's just one person, yeah, there's a lot of evil in this world. But can I do something to change it, to make it different? Yes. Yes, we can. You can't help everyone, but you can help someone. And I I pray that you will see that challenge and accept it for yourself. You can't affect everybody, but you can affect one person. And and don't you know that the the family of the man that he served was affected and and, and that that goodness and and that grace radiated out from that one person and that, that selfless act. I don't think God is calling us to any less today. Things aren't different now because uh, of, you know, times are different. He still says, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, he still says that. That's still the challenge to you today. And I pray that you will find that one thing that you can do to make that difference. That you will commit your life to that pattern of even if, even if it means sacrificing, that I will follow Jesus. I will love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. This morning, this morning, if, if you're not yet on that path of Living your life for a cause that matters. I want to encourage you to consider uh, the significance of baptism in making that change in the entire direction of your life. Repent doesn't mean just turn away from a life of sin and go in the other direction, uh, transformation. It means changing everything. Your attitudes, your, your habits, your actions. Your actions. 